Merle Lewis, and I have the great pleasure of serving the Organization of American Historians as the President-elect. But this evening, it is my distinct honor to introduce my colleague and friend, Ed Ayers, President Emeritus of the University of Richmond, where he currently serves as the Tucker Boatwright Professor of the Humanities. A Southerner by birth, as well as a student of the South, Ed has redefined the contemporary meaning of the scholar historian in the public square. Formerly a Dean of Arts and Sciences at the University of Virginia, Ayers has won awards for his scholarship, for his teaching, and for his service to the profession and the nation. After graduating from the University of Tennessee and earning his doctorate at Yale University, Ayers set out on a career that had him scale three peaks of achievement simultaneously. He flooded the profession and the general reading public with lucid, analytically sophisticated, and elegant historical studies. He excelled at teaching as it occurred in the classroom and throughout the media, especially in the digital world. And he moved into academic administration, proving that lending one's talent to the improvement of an institution was no flirt with the dark side, <laughs> but rather the intelligent decision to bring light caring and passion to the venerable places we call universities. The result has been a stockpile of accolades and awards. Ayers the Scholar burst onto the scene in 1984 with the publication of Vengeance and Justice, Crime and Punishment in the 19th Century American South. This important book centered on the intersections between crime and region, race and class, and power and privilege. He followed with the groundbreaking interpretation of the New South, the promise of the New South, life after Reconstruction. I served on the OEH Raleigh Book Prize Committee the year we praised the work. As I recall, the committee thought he put into play the contradictions and the ambiguities that so vividly captured much of human history. In his telling, progress competed openly with repression and backward bigotry, Technology freed some to earn fortunes and tethered others to indebtedness, and railroads rendered new cities such as Atlanta winners, and by their absence turned others into afterthoughts. The breadth and the grace of this book made it a finalist for the National Book Award and a Pulitzer Prize. Ayers has been not only an imaginative scholar, but also a forward looking interpreter of history. Along with students and colleagues, he used the power of the digital to illuminate life during the Civil War from a northern and a southern perspective. The Valley of the Shadow, two communities in the American Civil War, a combined CD-ROM and book project brought into the open how historians could use digital tools to tell a story that words on a page alone could not. Today, it exists as an online service with millions of visitors. The Gilda Lerman, Gilda Lerman Institute in Gettysburg College recognized the effort with the E. Lincoln Prize for the best digital project. His interest in the Civil War culminated in the 2003 publication of In the Presence of Mine Enemy, Civil War in the Heart of America, the 2004 Bancroft Prize winning study of the nation's moment of tumultuous internal conflict. A second book from that initiative appeared in 2017 the thin light of freedom, civil war, and emancip emancipation in the heart of America, and earned a Lincoln Prize from the Gilda Lerman Institute in Gettysburg College, and as we noted yesterday, received the Avery O. Craven Award from the Organization of American Historians. At the same time as scholarship garnered him attention and acclaim, so too did his teaching. In 2003, the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching named him the National Professor of the Year for research and doctoral universities. Soon thereafter, he demonstrated teaching came in many forms and took place in many settings. Many Americans know Ayers as one of the co-hosts of the nationally syndicated radio show and podcast, Backstory, which first aired in 2008. Ayers and colleagues sought a program that was, quote, about how the past has shaped who we are today, end of quote. For many, it is a visible expression of public history. Ed joined his scholarly interest with a keen understanding that institution building requires dedicated leadership. From 2007 to 2015, he served as president of the University of Richmond. During his tenure, the university expanded its national profile, diversified its student body, 
and establish a focused set of strategic priorities. Through scholarship, digital experimentation, outstanding teaching, and public service, Ayers has shown his commitment to the advancement of the profession. A fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the nation honored him in 2013 with the National Humanities Medal. Today, we simply applaud his achievements, thank him for his leadership, and proudly, proudly proclaim him the 2018 President of the Organization of American Historians. It airs. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. It's, it's kind of a shame I have to ruin that by giving a talk now, but uh, <laughs> I, I basked in it as long as I could. I, you know, it's really been my honor to serve as the president of the OAH, and I want to thank you and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, which you led in such an inspiring way, for the large grant in your honor that will allow us to bring a broad range of people who otherwise could not afford to attend the annual meeting to Philadelphia and Washington. Our members will be hearing more about this exciting and generous initiative in coming months, but I want to thank you on behalf of the organization and hand over to you the impressive gavel that is a symbol of so much power and authority. And it comes in a, prote a protective wrapper as well. <laughs> I'd like to thank the University of Richmond and W.W. W. Norton and company for generously sponsoring this event and the reception that will immediately follow my three-hour presentation. <laughs> uh, they've both been uh, wonderful allies over the years, and, and I'm really grateful for their support. OEH has a great staff in Bloomington. It's been a pleasure to get to know and work with Kathy Finley and Heine Selby and Beth Marsh and Annette Winorn and Aidan Smith, who sustain this remarkably complicated enterprise, and Ben Urban and his staff at the JAH, who uh, produced the excellent Journal of American History. We're very fortunate to have these folks, and I, I, I wish everybody could know them, because it, you'd appreciate uh, the remarkable work they do. I think we can all see those virtues on display in this meeting, which, as far as I can tell, looks like having to put up and take down a complicated circus every year. And, and uh, you know, getting to see what it looks like up close is actually kind of scary. Uh, and I, so I thought I would help by uh, working with the program committee to give an unorthodox focus and make us record every session and things like that, just because it seemed like she had mastered all the other stuff and it would do that. So. And I w I'm talking about it right now, but she's on the phone back there. I can see her through the door doing something even later. So uh, listen, she's acknowledging this now, but still embarrass her later uh, by doing that. Now, the volunteer leadership of the OAH is remarkable as well. Visiting with and reading reports from the committees is clear how much thought and care people put into this largely anonymous work. Colleagues work to promote public history, to protect academic freedom, to grow our membership, to build connections with partners in primary and secondary schools, to recognize strangers' works, and to secure a place of equity for everyone in our profession. The executive board worked so hard to keep the OAH sound and moving forward, responding to challenges and opportunities with energy and imagination. And the program committee, what a terrific job they've done. I'm sure every president feels that her or his program is especially good, uh, but I'm sure that ours is. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, if uh, Will and Claudrina, Claudrina Harold and Will Thomas chaired this, and if there are other members of the program committee who are here and stand up, I'd like to thank you. Other people here? Yes, there we go. Yes. Yeah, there they are. Now, as it turns out, these sincere thanks lead directly into my talk, which begins 87 years ago. Now, presidential addresses to historical organizations are not generally newsworthy, but in 1931, Carl Becker's speech to the American Historical Association made it into the New York Times. It may not have hurt that Becker's speech was interpreted as a slap in the face of the professional historians, and it was called Every Man His Own Historian. Now, Becker opened with a disarming parable, set the morning when Mr. Every Man wakes up and thinks about, quote, things said and done yesterday in the office, the highly significant fact that General Motors had dropped three points, a conference arranged for 10 o'clock that morning, a promise to play nine holes at 4.30 in the afternoon, and other historical events of similar import. 
but feeling something amiss in the day before him, Mr. E looked in his pocket notebook and sure enough found a note to himself. December 29th, pay Smith's coal bill 20 tons, $1,017.20. Yeah, we're all historians, you will have noticed it's December 29th and he's going to play golf in Cornell at Ithaca, New York. There's that. And it turns out that he admits in a letter later on he had no idea how much coal in, and this was paying three times as much as he was supposed to. But we'll look beyond that. It's a parable. Okay. So Mr. E visits Mr. Smith, who consults his own records and tells Mr. E that he's misremembered. Mr. Smith didn't have the kind of coal he went, so he unfortunately went to Mr. Brown. So he goes to Mr. Brown, checks his records. Sure enough, he did deliver that coal. Mr. E pays him, and now, quote, Mr. E's mind now rests satisfied. The point of the simple story is this, quote, Mr. Everyman would be astonished to learn that he is a historian. Yet it is obvious, isn't it? that he has performed all the essential operations involved in historical research, consulting documents, making inferences, correcting errors, and constructing a narrative. The story of Mr. Everyman shows that we all do history every day, that we sometimes get it wrong, but that chastened by a reliable documentary record and the will to use it, we can come closer to the truth. This is what all my freshmen take from this story. I'm the historian, I'm not even trying. It's great, you know. I, I've been a historian my whole life. It, they, they pay you for this? <laughs> yeah. But the parable of the coal is not really Becker's point. Rather than paying close attention to evidence, it turns out, Mr. Everyman weaves his sense of the past out of anything and everything. His impression of history is, quote, an imaginative creation, a personal possession which each one of us Mr. Everyman, fashions out of his individual experience, adopts to his practical or emotional needs, and adorns as well may be to suit his aesthetic taste. No mere accountant checking his bills, quote, Mr. Everyman works with something of the freedom of a creative artist. Beyond and around the actual memories of personally experienced events, Mr. E, quote, embroiders a more dim, dimly seen pattern of artificial memories, memories of things reported to have been said and done in past times which he has not known, in distant places which he has not seen. Those artificial memories are what people call history. Now, Becker acknowledged that Mr. Everyman could not tell you how he weaves this outer pattern of memories, how it is that he gathers together, quote, the most diverse threads of information picked up in the most casual way from the most unrelated sources, from things learned at home and in school, from knowledge gained in business or in professions, from newspapers glanced at, from books. Yes, even history books read or heard of from remembered scraps of newsreels or educational films or ex cathedra utterances of presidents and kings. He cannot tell you how he constructs his sense of the past from 15-minute discourses on the history of civilization broadcast by the courtesy it may be of Pepsodent, the bull of a watch company, or the shepherd stores in Boston. We are not being subsidized by Pepsodent or bull of a watches, let's just be clear about this. <laughs> The kicker was that historians, Becker slyly observed, are ourselves, Mr. Everyman. The historian differs from our neighbors only because we take it as our job, he said, quote, to be ever preoccupied with that far-flung pattern of artificial memories that hovers in the cultural ether. Our job is to be preoccupied with artificial memories. The historical profession, both those who gave Becker a standing ovation and those who were outraged by his address, drew the same conclusion. Quote, it was treason against the profession, one friend wrote him jubilantly. It was glorious. It was grand. But I marvel that you were not tied to a stake and pelted with heavy tomes full of actual self-expressing facts. Now, while no actual tomes of actual facts were launched at Becker, the record shows, many professional historians did feel insulted by his address. After all, to be ever preoccupied with artificial memories, a passive construction of a weak verb applied to a dubious object, hardly bolstered professional pride or purpose. Even that were translated into Latin, I don't think that, that would be a great motto. <laughs> Some found this portrayal particularly insulting because historians had worked assiduously for the preceding half century 
to build a profession based on the gathering of historical materials and the disinterested analysis of those materials. Now they found themselves dismissed as naive. Even worse, if the New York Times was correct and everyday people were indeed, quote, the models and masters of the professionals, where did that leave professional historians? After hearing Charles Beard make a similar argument two years later from the same platform, the next president of the AHA mourned the death of that noble dream of scientific, objective, and useful history. Now this conversation was not only an American conversation, of course. Becker taught European history, drew ideas about history from cosmopolitan conversations, and published an influential book on the Enlightenment the year following his famous address. Countries then and now all around the world struggle with the meaning of history, especially their national histories. But Becker's charge, because he was an American, using an American everyman, and speaking in an American setting, resonated here with particular force. But as if to prove the instability of history, the heyday of the so-called relativism of Becker and Beard proved short-lived in the United States. In the Great Depression that plagued the nation for year after year following Becker's speech, historians set out to collect new kinds of evidence. Under the auspices of the New Deal, these historians gathered oral testimony from elderly former slaves, wrote massive state histories and deep local histories, indexed moldering newspapers and microfilm government records, captured powerful photographs and documentaries. Becker himself set aside his ironic detachment to support American involvement in the World War, insisting that democratic values do in fact, as he wrote, have a life of their own apart from any particular social system or type of civilization. He died in 1945. In 1955, C. Van Woodward, in the same year he published The Strange Career of Jim Crow, wryly told an audience at Oxford University that he admired Becker, even though the late historian's pronouncements were, quote, capable, when loosely construed, of breeding mischief of a serious character among the laity. <laughs> Woodward compared Booker to Martin Luther, preaching, he said, quote, a sort of secular reformation of relativism, a new Protestantism that gives license to the layman to consult the sacred text for himself and seek out its meaning without mediation of the priesthood. Now, Woodward did not want to launch a counter-reformation, but he did insist that the historian, quote, must retain a fundamentally unshakable conviction that the past is real, however hard it may be to define its nature and write an unbiased history of it. Now, Woodward was writing in the midst of the Red Scare and McCarthyism, and he insisted that whatever the difficulties of evidence and interpretation, quote, the historian must never concede that the past is alterable to conform with present convenience, with a party line, with mass prejudice, or with the ambition of powerful popular leaders. Woodward granted the intrinsic uncertainty of historical knowledge, but insisted that we had no choice but to write the most honest history we could with the imperfect evidence before us. Now, as we all know, succeeding decades have seen periodic attempts to reckon with the epistemological issues Becker raised, but Americans don't really like to do that all that much. Uh, and I think that the profession pretty much has agreed with what Woodward said in 1955. The AHA's recent discipline, discipline core defines history as, quote, an interpretive account of the human past, one that historians create in the present from surviving evidence. Evidence that is necessarily, quote, incomplete, complex, and contradictory. Thus, those who study the past, quote, must recognize the provisional nature of knowledge, the disciplinary preference for complexity, and the comfort with ambiguity that history requires. So, American historians have been inspired by Becker's iconoclasm, but not his ironic detachment. It's not really the American way. Instead, historians have poured their energy into expanding the range of the nation's history. As we all know, African American history, women's history, working class history, LGBTQ history, and ethnic history emerge as dynamic and exciting fields, defining new frontiers to explore, raising their own issues of evidence, of silences in the archive, of the construction of identity, and the role of memory in history. 
After great struggles by pioneering historians and brilliant examples of what those historians could produce, the profession slowly began to build a diversity of membership and leadership as well as broader fields of study. At the same time, in a parallel development also inspired by democratic aspirations, libraries and archives across the nation began to create virtual copies of their manuscripts, images, films, sounds, and three-dimensional artifacts. Millions of images of newspapers and government records, millions of pages of books and journals became available in a way they had not before. And they continue to pour out today. With the advent of social media and the smartphones that feed them, moreover, this archive has begun turning inside out, appearing everywhere, all around us, often for sale or selling us something. Personal memories weave into one another and into the commercial and public realm. People instantly share a record of their lives, often as images or videos with one or a dozen or thousands or millions of people watching, curating timelines of their lives, even as a shadow record grows, an archive of things that people view, share, call, purchase, or query, stored and shared by companies, political operatives, and criminals. Today, pieces of the past appear everywhere around us. We can read, hear, and see only the news we want to hear. We live in an audio world that can play the songs we loved when we were 14, 18, 21, or 33, uh, shaping our moods as we murmur to a speaker that is murmuring to us at the same time. The ubiquitous past weaves into journalism, opinion pieces, blog posts, video clips, memes, humor shows, feature films, Twitter feeds, documentaries, television series, and podcasts, all pulling from the swelling archive of the multitudinous past for their own purposes. Even more than in Carl Becker's time, when powerful and seductive electronic technologies had begun to emerge, shared memories and private memories can easily fuse. Our private interior history and the artificial memories that constitute history morph into one another. Boundaries blur and disappear. Everyone has become their own historian, their own curator, and archivist and narrator. It makes me want to have a drink of water. <laughs> so what's the professionally trained historian's responsibility in this world? When there, is, when there are so many claims to historical knowledge and authority, where there are so many possibilities for new kinds of history. Let's return to Carl Becker's address when these patterns began to take shape and form. There, he offered challenges to three separate aspects of the historian's work. First, he challenged the representation of history when he argued that history continually emanates from radio shows and newspaper headlines and suit coat pockets as well as from history books, the representation. His second challenge came to the discipline of history, when he argued that we must acknowledge how contingent and fragmentary our understanding of the past must necessarily be. And Becker's third challenge came to the profession of history, when he argued that the collective and cumulative search for an objective, self-explanatory history was to search for an illusion. Now, these same issues trouble us today, in new and heightened forms. And we often feel these three aspects of things as a general, simple, a single generalized crisis. But it's useful to consider each of them, each of these challenges in turn, and see if they might offer opportunities that we have yet to exploit. So let's begin with representation. The saturation of artificial memory through electronic media accelerated when those media became digital. What we might think of as ambient history has grown, a history that seems to radiate everywhere from everywhere. Online forums hum with debates over history of every kind. Genealogy, fed by companies that provide digital so sources, has grown into the one, one of the most popular hobbies and lucrative businesses in the nation. Documentary film, taking advantage of new means of distribution and less expensive technologies of production, is flourishing. Video games drop players into the middle of the European theater in 1944. Virtual reality fuses past and present on actual battlefields. Audio tours create a sonic landscape of the past in cities of today. Museum exhibits tailor themselves to users' interests. Podcasts explain history in intimate voices, talking quietly into people's ears. 
In short, history is more visible and audible than it's ever been before. It's proliferating in scale and form. But things are different in the representation of the past in academic history, and perhaps Carl Becker would not be surprised by our caution. We have all become digital historians as we research, write, and share our work in electronic form, but we have not become deeply digital. Our research usually involves reading pictures of printed pages on screens, maybe some simple plain text. Their digital capacities reduced to simple searches. Footnotes that could be hyperlinks to sources instead often disguise a source's online location. Pretending to analog research, erasing a digital footprint. So we do digital research and hide it at the same time. Images and maps that could move do not. Sounds that could play remain silent. Connections to other work that could be made are not. Now, historians are only doing what people have tended to do when confronted with new technologies, that they put the old forms into the new ones as long as possible. Early moving pictures filmed vaudeville skits, early radio broadcasts played live musicians, and early television showed stage plays. These media took off when forms of expression tailored for them appeared, but it took a few years for the dissolve in film, the audio drama in radio, and the sitcom and television to develop. So it's been 25 years since the web appeared, so perhaps we will soon find the best way to exploit the powers of the digital for historical scholarship. Now we've already glimpsed the advantages of scholarship built expressly for digital media in the form of intentional archives and interactive visualizations and maps and podcasts and blogs. These contributions to the ongoing conversation that we call scholarship we know involve many more people and a broader range of people than print. We know that they move more quickly and more actively and less expensively than previous practices. We know they allow more people to see themselves in their own history and in other people's history. We know they align the democratization of our interpretation with the democratization of our audience that has not kept pace. What we have not yet shown, but which is clearly intrinsic in the media, is that digital scholarship can best capture the fundamental aspects of scholarship. Digital forms can gather and display evidence, relate that evidence to an argument in the literature, disseminate that argument broadly, and invite commentary, revision, and improvement. Pioneering journals have demonstrated these capacities, but historians seem to be waiting for something to happen, for some tipping point, before we reimagine our scholarship more broadly. Many historians, though, they've allowed their print subscriptions to newspapers to lapse and happily read their novels on digital devices, resist adapting scholarship to a purely digital environment. Books are a superb technology, of course, with tactile pleasures and great durability. Many of us fell in love with history through books, and we have been forever imprinted with that experience, and so we proceed the way we have the way we've done things since Carl Becker's time and before. So Becker's friend may have been surprised that no tomes were thrown at him after his address, but those tomes still stand at the center of our profession, even as the digital world swirls around us. Now that may be because the flood of new representations of history have come piecemeal, the product of different kinds of enterprises pursuing different purposes. We have no comprehensive view of their arrival or of their impact. Some come from august bodies, such as the Library of Congress and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Others come from powerful corporations eager to turn the pursuit of history into a commodity. Others come from undergraduates doing research in their local libraries. Others come from the labs and projects growing up at all kinds of institutions of higher education. Others come from independent scholars with particular passion. Cumulatively, these representations are creating a new landscape of memory, vastly more complicated than that of 1931, full of challenge and full of possibility. Even representations of the past from the past are being reimagined. As we talked about in the plenary session last night, Confederate statues prompt people to think about memorialization in new ways, as legacies of slavery long buried under skyscrapers and in university financial records come to light 
as designers struggle to memorialize recent events for which survivors still live and demand a voice. Now, many of these new forms of history have surfaced in this very meeting over the last few days, challenging conventional ways of thinking about the past, driving fascinating and engaged conversations. We can feel the ferment. We can feel the excitement in session after session. It seems that we are on the cusp of a significant and exciting change in the forms of representation, and I hope so. But this brings us to Carl Becker's second concern, the work the discipline of history performs, the practices beneath and around representations. For him, you'll recall, professional historian's job is simply to be ever preoccupied with some facet of the past that preoccupies few other people, if you do it right. <laughs> we cannot count on facts, and we cannot count on people's ability to recognize and act on facts. But though chastened by Becker's insights, I'm willing to argue that our discipline involves interpretation of every piece of evidence created before this moment. We can claim it all. Historians take nothing at face value but take all evidence seriously. We are wary interpreters, skeptical but relentlessly curious about the next piece of evidence, what it might reveal if you held it up to the light in just the right way. We know the entire historical record is an artifact of its time, and so are we. But that is itself more evidence. Don't you love it? <laughs> more material to take into account. This is the source of our perpetual energy and of our perpetual doubt, the engine of our restless revisionism. Historians understand that all things live in time, and we are no exceptions. So even taking mortality into account, there are reasons to be optimistic. As we include more people in the story of the United States, we also broaden our understanding of what legitimate historical evidence might include. Oral histories, faint archaeological traces, comic books, accounts of dreams and visions, records of lost sights and smells, reams of numbers that take shape when mapped, and other sources unexpected by previous generations. The founders of our profession talked of monographs as bricks that could be used to assemble walls and buildings. By the 1980s, Peter Novick noted at, the, at that time, historians, quote, were bringing to the building site Carrera marble and vinyl tile, thermopane and leaded glass, tapestries and plywood paneling. And that was in the 80s. We've got lots of new building materials since then that we're bringing to them. And we welcome it all. History is distinguished from other humanities and social sciences, in fact, by the very diversity of the materials that we combine. Our discipline lends itself with appropriate modifications to everything from poetry to census term returns, from mug shots to shellac recordings. For us, everything is context for everything else, with every context open to exploration on its own terms and in terms of its relationship with other contexts. The beautiful thing about this is our diverse evidence allows diverse forms of explanation, exposition, and exploration. We deal, we don't have the same forms, you know, that has to have the abstract, the introduction, the evidence. We can do anything we want to. We don't always, but we could any way we wanted to. We deal with partial evidence in open-ended ways, telling stories and suggesting explanations in potentially limitless forms of writing, filming, performing, gaming, and exhibiting. History museums. And historical places are thrilling places these days. More than half of the 35,000 museums in this country are historical. The biggest Broadway smash of the last 20 years, you may have heard, was based on a traditional biography of a founder and a novel based on a close understanding of Abraham Lincoln, but otherwise filled with ghosts, has been a bestseller and prize winner. So history then reckons with many kinds of evidence and invites many kinds of representation. A single discipline, apparently simple, but enormously powerful when adhered to, underlies everything that we do. That discipline requires that we are accountable to the record on which we base our interpretations, tell our stories, and make our arguments. Like all craftspeople, we respect the materials with which we work. We accept its knots 
and flaws and misshapen forms and unattractive colors as part of the story it has to tell. Its complexity is humbling. We know we will never have all the material we need to make perfect use of what we have. But the search, the discipline, is the ideal that demands respect, the purpose to which we hold ourselves and everyone else making a claim on the past. This discipline will not put an end to argument or revision, nor should it, but it can determine what aligns with the record and what does not. We can celebrate multiplicity in the forms of history because of our common basis of accountability to the historical record even as it changes. We can write books in new styles with new voices because they are grounded in evidence. Now we will always need specialized and technical studies. Monographs serve an essential purpose just as they did long before 1931 and we will continue to develop ways to dispense expert history in smaller and quicker forms. Blog posts, tweets, comments in public meetings, weaving our disciplines into conversations that need our discipline. Explaining history on the fly before diverse audiences demands knowledge of a particularly flexible and dynamic kind. History lives in the realms of commerce and journalism and publishing, and so the discipline needs people who know how to navigate that realm. The knowledge of history that teachers in elementary and secondary schools deploy every day requires a demanding expertise because so much is at stake. All practitioners of history are allies, united by a common devotion, to a common discipline. But where does the breadth and profusion and adaptability of that discipline leave the third part of Becker's analysis, the profession? At its inception, the profession, like other bodies appearing at the same time, defined itself by its professional opposition to other forms of practice. Physicians sought to reign in midwives, lawyers sought to focus training in law schools rather than law offices, and historians sought to distance themselves from antiquarians on one hand and moral philosophers on the other who monopolized claims to make sense of the past. Now, the earliest profession was a club of people with PhDs, overwhelmingly white, male, and Christian, who taught and wrote history within colleges and universities. It was led by a subset of men within that group, men who attended and then worked within a relatively few institutions. The historical profession built itself around concepts, then relatively new, sometimes imported, that served to secure the boundaries of the profession. Peer review, scholarship vetted by presses linked to elite universities, exclusive academic journals, scholarly meetings, extended graduate training, academic tenure, and departmental autonomy. We all know that these things advance historical knowledge, but they also secured the borders of the profession. Now, Carl Becker challenged the pretensions of this relatively new profession by telling his fellow academic historians they weren't really all that professional at all. Uh, they were not very important or influential in shaping the historical landscape of their fellow citizens and never would be. With an ironic, ironic shrug of his shoulders, Becker told historians to acknowledge that history was not a scarce resource to be mined and its nuggets carefully meted out to the masses. Instead, people could find what they considered history everywhere, all over the place. They didn't need historians to hand it to them. So the historical profession did not demand, as medicine and law and many other less prestigious professions did, a single standardized exam or an admission interview. In fact, despite the efforts of the historical profession, everyone who could write and conduct research continued to call themselves historians. We had no certificates or badges or anything else to give out. Anybody could say that. Any department that could get approval from its university could offer a PhD in history. Anyone who had taken history courses could teach at secondary schools. Anyone hired by a museum as an interpreter or trained as a docent would explain history to the public. And there seemed to be an apparently endless supply of people willing to devote themselves to history, regardless of the likelihood of a secure position or reasonable reward for their work. So, even though our field has always been made better by authors, teachers, and interpreters who, inquired, who acquired historical knowledge in informal or independent ways, these practitioners have not been welcomed by the profession, which maintained its founding exclusionary tone. 
Despite their contributions, or in the case of best-selling authors, because of their contributions, the profession has not welcomed these fellow practitioners. Public history had to make its case for years before being recognized as a valuable partner. Secondary and primary teachers have not always felt welcome in a profession that has focused its attention on writing rather than teaching. Community college teachers, people who teach but not on the tenure track, and independent scholars have not always found a place in a profession that seemed to bow before institutional identity. The digital world, while creating new opportunities, puts up its own barriers. Important parts of the digital archive have been monetized. Huge parts of the population are not represented in the archive or just as bad misrepresented. Digital collections critical for research and teaching are often available only to institutions that can afford them. Even adventurous scholars need to collaborate with people experienced in the world of building digital scholarship, but those people are only freely available within institutions and fortunate institutions of that. But that said, the electronic world creates an opportunity to share expertise with previously excluded citizens who write, find, and teach history. And it creates an opportunity for professional historians to create history in new forms with a broader range of evidence. Podcasting is a great example, with people launching their own shows and finding appreciative audiences with no support and just the passion that they have something to say, and it turns out that they do. Our professional organizations, especially the American Historical Association and the OAH, have long worked to advance the profession in heartening ways. And in fact, they've often displayed a vision that sees farther than many of their members. As we've seen this week, they can create places where people with a shared passion, pursuing that passion through different means, can come together and learn from and inspire one another. Now, our organizations are the product of enormous efforts over generations, and they have capacities we've barely begun to tap. The Organization of American Historians has a particular responsibility. It is the largest professional association of historians of the United States. Our subject and our mission can be better aligned. We can become a hub for all kinds of historical work about the United States, the place where we discover new kinds of evidence, new methods to bring to bear on that evidence, new vehicles to reckon with that evidence, and new arguments based on that evidence. To do so, we need to welcome everyone who practices history. Rather than an organization of American historians, we need to be an organization for American history. There's a civic meaning, a civic responsibility in being the largest group of the nation's historians. It need not mean that we are parochial or nationalistic. It need not mean that we compete with the American Historical Association, our essential partner, or the many groups that specialize in particular places or periods or topics within American history, but it does entail a responsibility to work with the nation, to challenge the nation, to cut across artificial barriers of institution and prestige, to take advantage of our multiplicity to be of greater use to one another. So here's the situation. We are confronted with new contexts for historical practice. At once, more discouraging, terrifying, and promising than we've ever known. We can't afford to let history to just happen to us. We have to make history. We cannot go back to simple ideas of fact and objectivity and authority. What we can do is take our discipline out into the world, showing that the historical record matters, that some evidence is more trustworthy than other evidence, that Context is necessary for any understanding of the past. Our profession will flourish by being an ally, a collaborator with every teacher, every writer, every blogger, every podcaster, every filmmaker, every archivist, every interpreter of public history, and I'll ally for everyone who explores American history for the greater good. Thanks very much, everybody.